Okay, so thank you, Federico. And again, uh, uh, hello to all the attendants, uh, all the people that are present now at this uh, uh, webinar. I'm Roberto Mantovani. Uh, just a brief presentation of myself. I'm a professor in animal breeding and genetics, and I'm involved as expert uh, at the Italian Ministry of Agriculture for the genetic improvement of the Italian epitrophic breed. Uh, my research areas of activity are made in the field of animal breeding, cognitive genetic uh, genomic as well, and breeding management in small or scattered population. And I am vice, vice president of the OS Commission at the AAP. Uh, I prepared just a, a brief uh, welcome for you. Uh, please wait a minute that I'm going to share my presentation. Uh, here we are. So today we are uh, experiencing uh, the eighth uh, uh, webinar at the AAP, and the title of the webinar is New Role for Old Friends, Equids in the 21st Century. Um, as you see in the slide, this is the welcome from the world, uh, people that uh, belong to the, 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 the boarding of the, the host commission at the president Chris Evans that will be involved in uh, a speaker today and uh, another speaker is Ana Sofia Santos that uh, was the, the former president of the uh, host commission and we have uh, also uh, many people participating at this webinar I've seen Clement Potoknik as a, a vice president myself uh, Isabel I don't see if she's connected but uh, she's a vice president and we have uh, uh, Jackie Trappist and uh, Pasquale De Palo, that's uh, the last one, is uh, uh, involved even today in uh, has, uh, uh, has, has give a speech anyway at the, the, the webinar. Um, so welcome, therefore, to everybody for the by the EAP or Study Commission. A few details about uh, the EAP or Commission for those that uh, do not know. Uh, the host commission. This is one of the oldest uh, commission among the 11 that are belong to the EAP. Uh, the classical topics that are uh, involving the studies and research carried out by people that uh, usually are, are used to um, be involved in the, in the host commission are genetics, uh, fish feeding, management, welfare, and so on. But uh, new emerging topics have been uh, developed in uh, recent years, like social economy, industry, equine education, therapeutic riding, with uh, with production, and so on. Uh, the host commission has uh, in, uh, um, participated even in uh, some working groups. So one uh, important work, working group uh, that started since the 80s is the Interstallion working group, where um, that interstallion works basically in uh, the joint genetic evaluation among uh, horse belonging to these countries. Uh, nutrition is another working group uh, that's uh, is involved in the uh, even in uh, preparing um, and carrying out uh, um, uh, congresses uh, or uh, meetings uh, on, on horse nutrition. Then we have social economy, the equine education, and therapeutic writing topics that are three new group working groups created recently. We have also uh, NICAR, ad hoc advisory committee that is uh, chaired by uh, Clement Potoknik, one of the vice president of the commission. Uh, in the last uh, uh, meeting in Davos, uh, the last meeting in Davos, we had the three team sessions. Uh, 43 accepted abstract, 29 and 14 posters. And as you can see, we were involved in section number eight, 28 and 58 it was a joint section that we did uh, welfare and uh, health uh, welfare, and, uh, welfare group. Uh, we participated even to a joint secondary science association joint symposium with the AP that was titled equity mix production scientific challenge and perspectives that was held on September 18, 2021. Um, today uh, we are uh, as I say dealing with this uh, seminar uh, before to talk about seminar I will give you a brief introduction about the uh, horse uh, 
activities uh, uh, that are followed by um, EAP, uh, the host commissioner at EAP. Uh, I would say that SHORS uh, is a multifunctional animal, although the host population at world level is small in comparison to other livestock species. Uh, and uh, it's about, uh, it's been estimated about 50, uh, 58 tons of animals uh, as compared, that is a small number in comparison with, uh, with the other species, as I said. And uh, this uh, species has been used in the past for work in agriculture, for leisure, but also for war activities. Over centuries, uh, it has experienced many changes uh, in terms of interest for its services to, to human. As an example, many European horse breeds were developed mainly for military purposes at the beginning, but in the 18th century, this use became obsolete and most breeds were converted to farming. So again, when the mechanization process of agriculture started in the middle of the 19th century, Many horse breeds have faced a progressive decline. Many of them, particularly the heavy ones, um, um, breeds have uh, uh, could be converted to meat production in some countries where, they, where, where there's a consumption of meat, so obviously. Today, the multifunctionality of small animals, uh, this animal has become progressively more important and new use of the horse have been proposed like in tourism, teaching, and new products like mare's milk, for example. Uh, moreover, uh, human horse relations and the horse welfare have become an important uh, uh, aspect that are followed even by many researchers uh, all over the world. So the aim of this webinar is therefore to present uh, some new role that this old friend does in the, the field of research, but also in practical activity and uh, interaction, obviously, with, with human activity. So, as you can see, the, uh, the, 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 the webinar will be uh, developed with a, a speech by Pasquale de Palo first, that will be, um, will be involving a, a speech that will deal with equity mix for modern diets. Then Anna Sofia will drive us to the biograzing, uh, so like agroecological roles for equity in sustainable landscape uh, management. And after a uh, pause, uh, 10 minutes pause of, for a coffee, Chris Evans, the president of the Hay Horse Commission, will talk uh, about the rural horse in Panay's world, providing essential services to the European population. Uh, at the end, we will have a final discussion. Anyway, um, just giving a few details before we start about uh, organizational issues. The webinar is going to be recorded uh, and it will be further available at the AP website for member, uh, registered members. Uh, after each presentation that will last uh, about 10 minutes, we will have 10 minutes of questions and answers. And there, please raise uh, your questions in the chat box and I will read them to the, to the speakers in order to have a discussion on the presentation. Uh, turn off your video, please, and your microphone during the event. Uh, and uh, uh, one last thing, so the next uh, EAP webinar, uh, the uh, 9th of this will be entitled What uh, Could Be the Future of Cultured Meat? And so uh, it will be held on the 8th of February. And so any one of you could be uh, able to register and participate in the webinar. So now it's time to, to, to give you a few details about the first speaker, that is Pasquale De Palo, professor in animal science at the Department of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Bari, Italy. He is a member of the AC Commission. Uh, and uh, in the last 15 years, he focuses his research activity mainly on food production for equids, both meat uh, and meat. I would say that uh, I spent a lot of time, more than necessary, so I'm taking out my um, sharing screen and therefore giving the microphone to Pasquale uh, for his uh, presentation. So Pasquale, the uh, attendant uh, is yours. Thanks Roberto. And first of all, I need to thank uh, uh, EAP and particularly the Earth Commission for uh, allowing me to present this speech. Here uh, is reported the overall organization of, uh, uh, of this presentation. And uh, 
I took a lot of time uh, in planning this presentation because, of course, uh, as an animal scientist, uh, I focused mainly on the first half of the given title, Equids Milk. Uh, but I realized that uh, in a webinar with uh, uh, animal scientists and technicians, uh, dealing with uh, several common places, uh, like those reported in this slide, uh, should be really boring. So <laughs> I uh, tried to uh, change the focus of the presentation to the second half of the given title, Modern Diets, and uh, highlighting uh, not uh, uh, what we know about uh, equid milk, but what we need to know, what we need to deepen for supporting uh, this kind of supply chain. So the first question is, what does modern diet mean? And of course, it is a really uh, a big challenge to answer uh, in a short time to a so difficult time, uh, question. Uh, of course, we have to uh, distinguish the uh, developing countries and the developed countries. And of course, when we clusterize human uh, activities, human uh, uh, scenarios in black and white, we have, of course, uh, several degrees of grace uh, in the middle. Of course, the role of food in developed countries is totally different uh, from uh, the one in developed countries. Uh, while in the first scenario is uh, supplying uh, fundamental nutrients at low costs or at least at uh, uh, an economic value able to cover the world population. In developed countries, we have several meanings of modern diets according to social, heritage, cultural heritage, according to economic uh, uh, peculiarities of each consumer. So there is a, an overall segmentation of the consumer's per perception. And of course, we need to simplify because uh, I don't have uh, uh, too much time to deepen this aspect, but uh, uh, I tried to uh, clusterize, the, classify the different kind of meanings or the main definitions of modern diet for European consumers, according to uh, economy studies, and try to uh, evaluate how equid milk fit these kind of definitions. For several consumers, uh, eat, eating a food means uh, a sensory and uh, uh, storytelling experience. Eating a food means uh, uh, sensory, uh, sensory experience that needs to uh, deepen the knowledge uh, in the history. And for this, uh, uh, from this point of view, uh, equid milk is a winning uh, food because both donkey and horse milk have a very uh, long story, totally different histories, but uh, they uh, have a strong link with uh, uh, countries with the cultural heritage. But the main component of European population, and not only European, uh, uh, see consumers that uh, uh, when buy, uh, when choose a food, uh, they are aware that they are uh, making an ethical act. So food is chosen not for its own uh, qualitative patterns or characteristics, but mainly for uh, the environmental or sustainability patterns. For this reason, I try to uh, decline the uh, 
characteristics of equid milk according to the social sustainability, economic sustainability, and environmental one. Regarding social sustainability, uh, uh, I win easy. The dairy equid farming systems are uh, for their own characteristic socially sustainable. Uh, all the uh, farms that produce donkey milk, or, uh, mainly, and mare milk are socially sustainable because these kind of farms uh, produce other non-food utilities, uh, like visits with schools, animal-assisted uh, activities or therapies, uh, activities uh, uh, related to tourism, and some particular ones, uh, like uh, prevented, uh, preventing fire from forest and woods uh, through the undergrowth maintenance, or at least in mountain villages, the use of donkeys for uh, differentiating the waste uh, in uh, uh, all ancient uh, old centers where the mechanical beams are not able to cross. But what about economic sustainability? Actually, we don't know uh, a lot of, uh, uh, we don't have a lot of knowledge on this. Uh, when I made research, I found exclusively a paper from uh, agricultural economics, uh, econom economic scientists uh, from Brazil and a PhD thesis from uh, a PhD in economy and business from the University of Florence. And uh, their outcomes are uh, really near to my opinions. First of all, milk and meat represents the main uh, in economic incomes for uh, a farm that uh, uh, has donkeys or uh, heavy draft horses. The second aspect is that uh, the consumer perception for equids milk is really high. And moreover, this kind of product uh, isn't in the same uh, market area of uh, conventional ruminants milk. Consumers perceive uh, equids milk in a different area in a different category of food than uh, ruminants milk. They are uh, willing to use small amounts of mare or donkey milk daily, more like a drug than a food. Finally, there is a really high potential market to uh, conquest, to achieve. The problem is the low production, the small amount of production units, and the small amount of distribution companies. But both these aspects are often related to the lack of a specific regulation that allows to producers and distribution com companies to develop, to increase the, this kind of market opportunity. We have to say another thing that it is uh, uh, quite obvious for animal scientists, but it is not so clear for public opinion. We are not able to develop daily production from equids without uh, a collateral production of meat from equids. At nowadays, the small amount of equids milk produced allows to meat to be easily uh, placed on the market. But if uh, in the future uh, scenario, the idea is to increase the production of, the, of equids milk, we need, of course, to increase in the same way the market of donkey and horse meat. What about environmental sustainability? Of course, I will not say nothing on biogas and landscape because Sophia uh, will say better than uh, what can I do uh, uh, on this topic. Environmental impact. According to my best knowledge, there isn't a paper 
dealing with the environmental impact of one kilo of donkey milk of, or one kilo or horse milk, mare milk. We actually don't know which, uh, how is uh, set the environmental impact of this kind of uh, production. And according to me, it is not easy to forecast the results of this kind of research because it's true, donkey and horses are not high milk yield producing animals like specialized ruminants, but the horse and donkey uh, for milk production system is a low input system. Moreover, these are not ruminants animal. So, Actually, I don't know if one kilo of donkey milk uh, has a, a higher or lower impact than one kilo of uh, cow milk. Moreover, it is really difficult to define the system boundaries if we have to uh, define an environmental impact. How uh, can I, what can I do for taking account agricultural services? ecosystem services, social services. So it is a really uh, challenging uh, research activity that, that we need to know for, support, for supporting this supply chain. We <clears throat> have a, a wider knowledge, scientific knowledge on biodiversity. Uh, several colleagues uh, that work on animal breeding uh, are studying, studied, and will study uh, biodiversity in uh, uh, cold blood horses and donkeys. And the milk production represents for donkeys, but also for uh, heavy, draft, heavy draft horses, an opportunity not only for conservation, but mainly for the valorization of, this, uh, uh, of these animals. Because as uh, uh, Roberto said in the introduction, these animals are really different from several points of view, origin, uh, spreading uh, dynamics in Europe, uh, countries, but anyway, uh, both had the strong crisis due to the mechanization in agricultural activities. And we have really uh, several issues related to the uh, drop of the number of heads, the consistency of population and breeds that are really important for European agricultural and not only uh, activities. I go quickly to the uh, earth of this presentation. Of course, if we deal with the equids milk, we are uh, dealing with the role of this kind of food on human health. I tried in this picture to describe two different ways of approaching to the relationship between equid milk and human health. On the left, you see the food as it is. On the right, the real effect of that food on the physiology, on the pathology, on the biological functions of different categories of humans. These two, two kinds of research are fundamental, but in equids milk, we have very uh, several research dealing with the characteristic of equids milk as it is, and this is uh, the result of the good work of animal scientists and food technologists, but we have really poor knowledge on the effective roles of this kind of food on the biological system of humans. Uh, just uh, uh, as an example, I asked to uh, my Italian colleagues, uh, uh, an outstanding researcher in uh, human nutrition, uh, to send me a slide that uh, uh, he show, shown in a, uh, showed in, a, uh, in another webinar. 
uh, he calculated the uh, oxidant radical absorption capacity of different kinds of food, chocolate, uh, blueberry, honey, lettuce. Then he carried out clinical trial on healthy adult humans and evaluated the effective antioxidant effect of that kinds of food and was totally different. So we know several uh, aspects of the objective quality of equids uh, milk, but actually we don't know in many biological functions, which are the real effects of this kind of food. These are only, and it is not exhaustive, the, uh, uh, the, the studies that they found in the last 15 years uh, using Web of Science as a uh, research, uh, um, uh, research engine, and they found in the last 15 years, more than 350 studies on mare and donkey milk. Of this, the 60% was by European researcher, according to the nationality of the first author. And of this, let me say that the 40% was by Italian researcher. But is this enough for uh, promoting equids milk as a healthy uh, supply for humans? The answer is not. And uh, uh, I suggest all uh, of the interest one to read this uh, very interesting uh, review uh, written by PISA colleagues both animal scientists and medical scientists that subdivided, subdivided in a clear way what is the potential effect and which is the science-based real effect of donkey milk after clinical trials. And you uh, perceive the totally different amount of knowledge on what is potentially stated and what is potentially, uh, what is really, uh, what, what really happens on uh, human biology. A good example of a good project for the promotion of uh, donkey milk is a project called Fortilat that was conducted by colleagues, animal scientists, food technologists, medical uh, scientists and representative, representatives of the European Bank of Breast Milk. And they tried with, they uh, carried out a randomized clinical trial that is the golden standard for the evaluation of the health effects on humans. In particular, they studied the role of uh, of the fortification of breast milk uh, with bovine milk, uh, actually hydrolyzed proteins of bovine milk and donkey milk on preterm infants born before the uh, 32nd week of pregnancy and uh, infants born with low birth weight, under one kilo and a half. And they found really several results in part are uh, explainable because the higher tolerance, the uh, lower feeding interruption frequency is of course due to uh, directly related to some characteristics of donkey milk, the high uh, uh, lactose content. So the uh, high tolerance due to the similarity with the human milk but there are other biological effects that it is difficult to relate to the uh, uh, composition or activity of donkey milk. So 
the information that we gain through randomized clinical trials is the plays the key role of the res scientific results able to support the use of this kind of food in the in a medical context i tried to find something similar on mare milk and unfortunately i did find in the official uh, scientific databases scopus uh, uh, pubmed uh, web of science uh, papers dealing with this kind of topic and I found, on the contrary, this paper that is uh, in a journal uh, out from the official scientific uh, uh, channels, but uh, it is really interesting because it is uh, the use of mare milk in a double-blind random clinical trial study in case of children affected by hyperactivity that is uh, usually often associated with sleep disorders, which, are the, which were the effects of 200 milliliters per day of mare milk on the sleep quality in this kind of pathological children, the results are astonishing. Probably the collocation of this kind of research uh, is out of the official uh, channels probably for the poor number of children that uh, were involved in this, uh, in this clinical study. There were only 30, 15 uh, treated with the mare milk and the 15 control one. But let's uh, focus uh, uh, some minute on the main uh, use of uh, uh, equids milk cow milk protein allergy. Uh, in this slide, you will find the unique lines of a review written by the European Association of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. And this review is uh, the uh, update of the guidelines of the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Group. And as you, uh, as you uh, will see, the role of donkey and mare milk is not so good perceived by medical, uh, uh, medical category. Why? Although there are several papers dealing with the role of equids milk on cow milk protein allergies. The reason is this. There are too much perspective studies, meta-analysis studies, poor number of randomized controlled clinical trials. Moreover, there are several kinds, several types of cow milk protein allergies, EG mediated, non-EG mediated, associated with bowel, bowel uh, inflammation or not. And of course, the efficacy of equids milk, mare or donkey, differs according to the pathogenesis of the cow milk protein, uh, protein allergy, which is the results, the, the, the uh, literature is not uniform in outcomes. There are several contrasting results. And for adding in guidelines, in official guidelines, some uh, tools useful for preventing or solving cow milk protein allergies, of course, medical uh, needs certain data, certain results. So what I'm saying is that the future for supporting uh, equids milk as a, a potential functional food is based mainly on uh, multidisciplinary research where animal scientists work with food technologists, medicals, biologists, and other uh, research categories aiming to evaluate the effective 
role of this kind of food on human health. Moreover, I'm aware that this kind of research is uh, very expensive, very long, and not always uh, public uh, granting research bodies are willing to uh, grant, to fund this kind of research. But the challenge for us in this sector is move towards the product quality as it is to the efficacy, effectiveness of this product on human biology. Roberto, uh, how many time? Uh, uh... Well, you should spend even a few minutes, uh, but there is no questions on the chat now, so you can take even more minutes if you need it. Okay. Just a few minutes on a topic that represents another important uh, aspect for the consumer perception, uh, animal welfare. Uh, in this sector, traditional farming doesn't mean good uh, welfare standards for uh, donkeys and mares. And uh, on this topic, there are several research in the last years. Uh, I can mention, for instance, uh, a very interesting project uh, between the Milano colleagues uh, with the Donkey Sanctuary, that is a charity in the UK that works uh, a lot on donkey welfare, but also uh, some research conducted by Turin colleagues. And uh, trying to find indicators of animal welfare, of course, using uh, animal-based measurements and, uh, uh, and data. There are several aspects that uh, have to be uh, deepened. First of all, the relation between dam, dam and fall uh, for milk production. Finding welfare indicators, milking technology. We have several uh, research uh, carried out on uh, milking intervals, milking frequency. But actually, we don't know uh, really which are the best uh, technological parameters of milking machine. Moreover, we are in the, in the era of the automatic milking systems in the recaus. How can we apply automatic milking systems in some species that need to be milked more frequently than dairy ruminants? because this could be really a contribution to the development of this kind of supply chain. The application of PLF, both for the evaluation of animal welfare and for the increase of the efficiency. We, are, we have a really poor knowledge on the effect of feeding and nutritional strategies for increasing milk yield and quality. So these are all on the edge research that we need to carry out for increasing uh, the opportunities for these species, but mainly for maintaining a rural economy uh, based on our history, our traditions and uh, in line and uh, in accordance with the, the request, uh, the worldwide request of sustainability. Thanks for your attention. So, thank you, Pasquale, for your, for your talk and uh, for interesting aspect that you uh, have raised in your presentation. Um, I do not see a. Uh, any questions on the chat, uh, but uh, I, I have one, just uh, uh, if you don't mind, we are spending minutes. Uh, Sophia, we are a little bit late, but not so much. Uh, I would like to ask you if there's uh, any key aspect that, so any key aspect in the milk composition of uh, in mares uh, that could be in some cases uh, uh, taken into account uh, 
compared to, to the other species, particularly with, with dairy cow. You didn't mention that maybe. Is, for example, fatty acid profiles much different from, from the other species or any aspect that should be considered for valorization of uh, the milk, uh, milk mares? There are uh, actually several uh, different aspects. For sure, the uh, fatty acids, not only concentration, but fat concentration, that is the most variable uh, qualitative pattern in, uh, uh, in uh, mare milk, but probably some researchers say that the different percentage of uh, fat in mare milk is due to the uh, different efficiency in milking. Uh, and so the different fat percentage is uh, uh, more due to the uh, partial uh, milking uh, and not to uh, uh, variability of milk as it is. The uh, fatty acid profile is totally different from ruminants, of course, because we, these are monogastric animals, so the unsaturation index is higher. Although uh, there is a high variability in fatty acids profile, uh, as uh, it has been uh, uh, demonstrated by, uh, in a paper by Turin colleagues, uh, according to the feeding strategies. Uh, these are monogastric animals, so we are able uh, really to uh, change the fatty acids profile to, according to the nutritional and feeding strategies. Thank you. Uh, I can see, okay. Okay, there's a, a question from, uh, from the attendant. Uh, could you comment on male offspring well in terms of uh, their fate? Am I right that they are meat animals in the majority of times? Yeah, uh, of course, uh, in, a, in a context uh, where there is the possibility to sell the males for uh, live animals in uh, other farms and uh, it is possible this is possible when the population is uh, poor when the uh, dairy farms are uh, poor in number and there is a request but uh, uh, of and mainly uh, until the european policy uh, ensures for uh, animals uh, uh, registered to uh, endangered or at risk autochthonous stud books uh, breed the possibility of uh, have grants for farmers. But the uh, higher amount of male uh, falls, uh, I don't see other destinies different from the production of meat. And this is, will be more and more true when uh, the uh, end by end, there will, it will be a growth of the sector. So thank you, Pasquale. We have to move on and uh, we are short in time and maybe we can uh, leave some more discussion at the end of all the presentations. Now is the time to uh, present Anna Santos. Uh, uh, let me briefly introduce uh, her. Uh, Anna Sofia is graduated in animal science and uh, has a master's in animal emotions and a PhD in animal science on equine nutrition. She is now currently the head of science and innovation at the Fidinov Cooperative Laboratory, vice president of the Animal Task Force. Uh, president of the Portuguese Association of Animal Science, and she has been in the past president of the host commission at the AP. Uh, last, she is a proud mother of three <laughs> kids aged 19, 17, and five years. She is enthusiastic of acquired productions and research. Uh, the title of, his present, of her presentation is Biograzing Agroecological Roles for Equids in Sustainable Landscape Management. So, uh, Ana Sofia, the, the attendant is yours. Okay. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you all. Uh, you are seeing my presentation? Yes. And you're hearing me. Perfect. So, first of all, thanks for the invitation. It's really good. It's funny 
with this computer stuff, we've managed to get so used to it that we actually feel happy when we see, you know, no names and we like, we feel like we're together, although we're not, but <laughs> it's funny. Uh, and it's really good to be with a lot of, of uh, friends, uh, even at a distance. Um, so, and also thank you for the invitation to be here talking about this biograzing which is um, an interesting name uh, it's a catchy one so i hope that you all got a bit what is this because if we think about it all grazing is biological right so yeah it is <laughs> so it's uh, just a different way of looking at things um i've tried and as as pasquale said i also spent a lot of time <laughs> on this presentation because it's um yeah, we don't want it, we want it to be, you know, general, but at the same time focused, so it's not easy. Uh, I, I'm going to try to focus on exactly grazing and the advantages that we can take off of equids on specific types of, of grazing managements. But of course, if we go to the agroecological roles, uh, they are much, we can put a much wider uh, roles be, be, besides grazing, okay, uh, as, as landscape management for equids. So, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm going to start, um, don't worry, I'm not going to go into <laughs> the political aspects of the new common agricultural policy, but uh, in fact, the new cap, uh, which is now in the transition period, we have one year and something to, you know, to make it work. Um, not sure how, but anyway. Um, and eventually, we might have an opportunity here with the new, with the new, with the new cap to, to promote some of these. Uh, I'm going to call it right away services that we can take not only of horses, but you know, of herbivores in general. But I'm going to focus on equids today, um, and that's why I've put this slide here and also this one. Uh, so you know, the objectives. There are nine objectives, and I would highlight not by order of preference, but because of related to this uh, presentation, these ones, you know, so climate change, um, environmental care, landscapes, generational renewal, uh, and rural areas. And rural areas are, in fact, one of the focus of, of pillar two of the new cap. Um, and it's also a big problem because, yeah, uh, rural areas are really nice. Everybody likes to go in the summertime uh, when it's good weather to visit the mountain and, you know, to go to the countryside. It's all very lovely and very bucolic and so pretty. Um, but if you live there and in wintertime, today actually is a great day. I, and and I'm, I don't live in the high mountain. I live uh, in the lower mountain, so it's pretty soft here. But today is a great day. But on Saturday, it was awful it was freezing and you know you couldn't see the sun for the whole weekend <laughs> uh, and it wasn't snowing because it's down here but up there it's it's snowing so yeah uh, rural areas are are a big deal uh, and we need to keep people living there but for people to live there we need to give them uh, you know economic income <laughs> and and good quality life which is not only related to you know a quiet and a beautiful landscape and whatever. Uh, so this is, you know, this is a hard equi equilibrium to have. Uh, if if we uh, look at the numbers and and you know they are they're there. The rural population is is continuing continuously decreasing and urban population is continuously increasing. So uh, it is still a problem. It has been a problem like for every every time <laughs> it's always a problem um and we don't seem to you know to 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 go this around and to to put it the other way around um so these are mainly the areas if we go to mountain areas and i'm, I'm gonna focus a, a bit more in in mountain areas because you know it's the closest to me um and and mountain and mediterranean areas um and if, if you take a look at these pictures, these are Portuguese, but I have some French, which are very close as well. Uh, you, you will have these areas, you know, and these are obviously pasture and grazing, you know, areas. And you can see some animals here. They're not horses. In this case, they're cows. And then you have, you know, all these areas. And this, this is mountain. This is bush. This is bushland. So this is rangeland. It's not grassland. 
Uh, and if you see it here, it's the same. So you, you know, we have pastures here, and these areas they they will be used for pasture and also for hay production. It's a multi-use system in these areas. And then you have um, when you stop having animals, this is what happens. So this area here, and you see the you know you can see the wall in here. This area was a pasture area, and now it's bushes all over. So this is what happens when you don't have animals in there because animals keep you know, the grazing areas, animals keep the meadows, the natural meadows, animals help keeping all of this. Um, and, and this is what's happening throughout Europe um, due to the, the decreasing number of grazing animals that, that we have throughout. Uh, this, is, this is in France, I told you this, this is not in Portugal and we see the same pattern and we see the same problems. Um, and, and well, the, the, the problems are the same. Uh, we all remember, especially uh, us who have lived through it in the more the Mediterranean countries, and but also in the northern countries, it's becoming more and more usual, unfortunately, uh, forest fires and rural fires. Uh, we had them in 2017 in Portugal. It was really terrible. It was a tragedy. Uh, we've seen them every year in Greece, in Italy. We start to see them in Finland, in Switzerland. Um, so this is, yeah, this is climate change, but not only. This is also unmanaged forest and bush. More than forest is bush expansion. Uh, and people not being there in, in, in rural areas to manage all, all this biomass. So this is a, yeah, it's, it's a, a, an explosion <laughs> literally waiting to happen. And unfortunately, uh, some years it does happen. So fire prevention, and, and we've seen throughout our countries, millions of euros being spent in fire combat, and it's needed, of course. Um, of course, we also see some money being uh, invested in fire prevention. Um, but if we maybe if we look at the, the different amounts of money, eventually, it's they're not comparable. Um, it has become especially and now I'm talking more in Portugal, um, um, a battle to uh, invest more in fire prevention and managing these rural areas. And animals have actually become a part of some policies um, to, to do this, which, which is interesting. Um, I also take the chance to put here, and this is, this is a, a, a slide from the Animal Task Force uh, Strategic and Innovation Agenda, um, that was published in, in 2021. And uh, building the circular and sustainable agri-food systems, keeping the animal or replacing the animal in the center as you know of, of the whole system is needed and is actually something that is being pushed forward everywhere. Um, because if we if we remove animals, and we all know that uh, you know animals at this point. <laughs> are being uh, highly attacked, uh, this, this could be a problem. And putting animals in the center, using their power, especially herbivores, okay? Especially herbivores. Uh, the power, because it is a superpower, <laughs> that they have to transform herb and bush and grasses um, into, uh, you know, high protein. And, and yes, horses do produce milk and do produce meat. And horses, as Pasquale just referred, horses equids in general, they are generally low input production systems. So they are, in my opinion, I know it's biased, I know it's biased, but they are, in my opinion, um, like the perfect um, um, species to be used in this. Um, they will uh, eat and they will clean areas and they will give us protein and they will give us uh, milk and um, they, will, they will help maintain uh, biodiversity and keep and maintain some, some of these areas. So, so it, is, it is actually important. And at the same time, they will also produce manure. They will leave it in the soil and they will contribute to all this cycle that is shown here. So uh, if we also look at the numbers and these, these were presented by Anne Motte in, in Davos this year, it was a great presentation. It's actually online, you can see it in the AEP channel. Um, and I'm gonna focus on this area. 50% of, of, of the area used by livestock uh, is pastures and rangelands. And this area is can only be used by herbivores. 
And this is not only cows, this is also horses, okay? Because they are herbivores. Of course, this is cows, goats, sheep, horses. And horses are here. A lot of these areas are used exactly by horses. If we look at you know, the three pillars and we all talk a lot about sustainability and Pasquale you know, talked about all these three issues. We have the environmental one, the social one and the economic. Uh, and then we have all these clouds of all these very lovely um, you know, words and phrasings that um, you know, we need to use. And a lot of times we don't even know why we are using it or in the context, if it's right or, or not. So this is the context we are now. Um, and horses, equids can play in, in, in our opinion, already play, but we, we need to further exploit this um, an, an essential role. Um, so what we would like to advocate <laughs> would be the reintroduction of large herbivores with the purpose of encouraging grazing as a way to maintain and or reactivate uh, grazing areas. And in this way, prevent bush encroachment loss of, meadow, of natural meadows and subsequent, subsequent biodiversity in these areas, regenerate habitats, and as a con consequence or a side stream, prevent rural fires as an externality, as, as it can be talk, called. Um, and this is, this is where we would focus. And now we would focus on equids. What are, you know, the, the what is this? What, what are we talking about? So the, the numbers and within the Horse Commission, uh, it's something, and I know that the the the, the, um, the current commission is still pursuing this. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> we will manage to get the numbers, <laughs> and you will manage to get the numbers. These are numbers for the European Horse Network, and we know that these are numbers are under what is actually true. Uh, but it is an industry, and it is a lot of animals. It is a lot of hectares of grassland, and attention in these 6 million hectares of grassland, these are mainly grassland, not all pasture and rangeland are included in here. So this is also bigger probably. Um, and there's a big economic impact of this industry. Um, despite this, the Erostat does not publish or produces any equine data since 1996, which is astonishing. Um, local national authorities as well, they stopped asking it. We had the um, agricultural census uh, last year uh, in 2020, um, and they didn't ask about equids, not horses or donkeys. So there's no numbers. If we're gonna look at the statistics, uh, the, the number of equids in the last uh, 10, 20 years, it's stabilized. It's zero, zero, not zero, but it's always the same number because they stopped asking about these animals, which is, uncomprehensible. Um, and so this is something that uh, the equine industry needs or should develop efficient socioeconomical models based on sustainable practice and diversification of activities. Um, and we, if, if we look, um, okay, we can have a lot of uses for the horses that we produce, but the production, horse production, independently if they go to meat, um, milk, uh, sport, leisure, whatever, they need to be produced, mares need to offspring. Uh, they, and this, this um, part of the cycle should, if we want to uh, address health and welfare issues and respect the, you know, the physiolo physiology of the animal, this should be done mainly on pasture uh, or, or areas, grazing areas. Um, so this is an opportunity to, you know, to, to put some, some, some more um, things in, in, in here. So what could we actually mean for or as agroecological roles for equids? Um, and we would be talking uh, mainly in, at this presentation of, of this, you know, of, of using, uh, putting, producing horses or donkeys in this area. So not in the very nice, lusty pastures, but, you know, in bush areas. Um, some grasses, a lot of bush. And the question is, do they thrive? <laughs> does it work? Well, it does. Of course, we have uh, several wild or, or free range um, herds throughout Europe that prove that, you know, they, 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 they manage. Um, 
And actually, they they one thing is if is if they are free ranging because if they are free ranging, they have they have free access to whatever they want, and they will look for it, and they will walk and 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 eat it. If they are not free range, can we make it work um, or not? Okay. So there are some particularities that that we should discuss very very rapidly. Don't worry, I'll I won't go into detail. Is uh, horses and diet selection? Okay. So we know that horses are grazers, they are herbivores and they graze, you know, they like green pastures, lusty pastures, and they are primarily grazers and they graze a lot and very well. <laughs> they manage to eat um, the sword at a very low height. And there's a lot of papers and a lot of um, papers that you can find on this um, and very, very interesting and very recent as well, according to the choices of sword height and, and a lot of, of issues. So uh, they, that's what they prefer. And they show the ability to modify the foraging behavior toward less preferred feed items if they need to. And this is interesting. And if actually they don't have enough grass, they will turn to bush and they will turn to a browsing behavior typical of goats. Um, so they have a high ability to browse and this ability is tightly linked to their morphological characteristic. They have, you know, they have teeth uh, incisors in the upper and lower incisors and they would do like this you know like um cut <laughs> cutting your nails and that's what they do to the grass so this allows them to together with the the lips that are very flexible to choose with the lips and then go with the you know with the with the teeth and just choose what they want and this is amazing when we look at them eating as you will see some pictures uh high thorns and they will go there and they will eat only what they want and then they are trickle feeders. And this is an amazing characteristic is that they just won't stand still. Okay, they just won't start eating and they just eat like that. No, they will eat a little bit here and then they move a little bit there and then they move again. And then they walk all day. So besides the impact that they have, by the way, they are eating because they can eat very low in, in, in the, the sport height. They will also... Uh, walk a lot so they will have a high impact you know by by their feet and walking throughout um when we talk about horses in browsing we will uh, and and actually the the picture for this this uh, webinar is uh, horses moving through a, a gorse um, area um they will eat gorse olex spp very well and this is interesting because gorse can have very big thorns and they will just, you know, first they will eat the, the new parts with, which are flexible and you can see them go with their teeth and just taking it out. Uh, but even when, when it's, it's hard, they will go and they will pick, you know, the, the soft thorns and they will eat it, which is amazing. And then Coluna vulgaris or Heather, uh, they will also eat it very well. And then we can have, and we can play with this. Of course, we, we don't have time, but we can play with uh, you know the overlap of grazing between equids and the other species. And we can see that sometimes they overlap, sometimes they don't. And we can also see if we look at this, for example, cattle, they don't choose that much. You know, they don't browse that much. They like the grass and horses as well. But when the grass is going low or unavailable, then they will introduce other items in the diet. And this allows horses actually to maintain a more steady body condition score than, for example, cattle or sheep. And then, of course, goats, you know, goats are, are goats. That's, that's goats. Um, so sometimes of the year, we have these species overlapping. Sometimes they don't overlap. Sometimes they overlap a lot. And we can play with this uh, if, if we want to promote uh, animal production and also um, maintaining and working the, the, the areas that we are pastured. However, the impact that these guys have, and this is, this is uh, donkeys, these are not horses, but, but it will be the same. It's amazing, okay? This is uh, the same area, and it's a one-week difference photograph, okay? This is the study we conducted a few years back with, with um, donkeys. Of course, this was in an, in an area where we put a heavy load of animals because the objective was exactly to clean the area, and actually, in one week, we had two hectares with the five donkeys completely cleaned, okay, completely. No gasoline was used to 
put the machines that cut <laughs> working, only donkeys. And it was really, really nice. So and these animals, they are selective eaters. They have a volatile feeding behavior and they will contribute to biodiversity maintenance and to shrub encroachment in mountain and other areas. I have at this moment, and this has been going on at least for three years now, I have one donkey and two horses, and I don't. I only feed them in, in, in the winter time with, the, actually this winter, I've only spent a big round bale of hay because they are literally cleaning the neighbor's areas. You know, they, they started one a few years back, one neighbor, ah, you mind putting your horses in there because yeah, the, the grass is too high. Or, okay, we're gonna put them there. And then the other neighbor and then the other neighbor. And at this moment, I don't charge because well, actually I don't spend money <laughs> feeding the horses, but yeah, it's the services uh, that, that, that these animals are providing. They are cleaning <laughs> areas. Um, which is uh, which is very interesting. So, can we use this for you know for for fire prevention? And I'm gonna, I know I have ten minutes. I'm gonna very brief talk you through this, uh, which has been the last two years we've been um, aiding in this, and it has been a, an amazing experience. This is a, an area um, in a mountain uh, in close by, in in my house in Portugal, and we've had um, these two control areas where we didn't do anything so we didn't do controlled fire we just let it as it was and it was filled with um, bush gorse heather and and whatever very tight very dense we couldn't even walk through with a big height like one meter or more in some areas um, and then we did controlled fire um, in 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 uh, one area and we we um, close this area and and that's only the only thing we did so we we burnt everything and and that's it and in the other part we burnt and then we put animals we burnt we left one year you know to regenerate and then we put animals in there 24 7 for two years uh, we put three horses in three hectares so it was one one horse per hectare uh, in this in this orange area and yeah and and that's it we just let them there. So the area was closed. We had water points and we just let the animals there 24 seven for exactly two years. And during these two years, these animals, yeah, they, they, sometimes it was hard. <laughs> it was raining. It was cold. It was snowing. We need to feed them in the winter. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, you know, the, the procedure, but we fed them very often. I can tell you that for two years, we spent small hay bales, um, 50 hay bales in two years, which is nothing actually. Uh, and about maybe 100, 150 kilograms of concentrate feet for two years as well for three animals. Um, and uh, yeah, and we just, you know, watch them and observe them. You can see them here eating. And this is, uh, this is coarse mainly. That's, that's what they like mostly. Um, this is um, a detail of, of a blue butterfly in, in our area, which is endangered and you know needs um, actually animals grazing so that the flowers can bloom and the, the butterflies can, can reproduce and, and continue. Um, and you see throughout the year, so this was in the first year, this was actually in the second year. Of course, it, it was changing throughout the years. Um, and it was very interesting. We did also um, behavior observations. So we stood there from sunrise to sundown in the summertime. Uh, with, it was uh, 37 degrees at two o'clock, more or less. Uh, and yeah, the animals stayed 80% of the time in foraging behaviors. Uh, two periods on, on average for water drinking. They would go to the water area, which was in this side of, of the, the, the parcel. And they didn't show any pattern in their roots, in their foraging roots, which was actually funny. You know, it was completely random. So they one day they would do one thing and the other day they would do another, but one thing, they would go through the whole three hectares uh, throughout the day, just, you know, wandering around. Um, and the impact in these two years was amazing because none of this existed. And you see here these paths, you know, 
and this area. So um, you can see it very clearly in this picture down here, in here. Um, so you don't see any of this in the control area uh, where you know we burnt, but we didn't have animals. None of this exists. Um, and you, we can actually see here uh, a, a distance uh, when the flowers were, were of Ulex were coming out. Yeah, the, in here, much more flowers because this is what the ungrazed area than here. Um, yeah, and the animals just stayed here. The, we have data, but it's the, it's the colleagues from the botanical area that are still working the, you know, the, the height and the um, difference in botanical composition data. We don't have it yet. But what we do have is that in these control areas that we didn't burn, we didn't do anything. The bush height after three years, it's higher than one meter. And it's impossible to go in there and to walk through. Um, and if you know, if a match just goes in there, it will. It's like it will go everything because it's really, really dense. And then in the control area with no grazing, the bush height is approximately sixty centimeters after two years of the fire, with very dense vegetation. So it's better than the other one but not clearly as better <laughs> as the, uh, the, the place where the animals were, uh, where we have 20 to 40 centimeters, it dep depends on the places. We have very dispersed vegetation. We have uh, lots of roads. We have um, um, uh, you know, a very different panorama in, in this area. At this moment, okay, the study stopped. The animals are not there. I can tell you that these animals, they are still doing what they were doing here. Um, so they are still cleaning areas. <laughs> um, and, and of course, this is very nice, but since the animals were closed, we need to take care of them they, because they couldn't leave. So we need to ensure that they had water. We need to ensure that we needed, we needed to feed them when the, the bush availability was not enough to ensure their body condition score. And even so, you know, we let some fluctuations occur and the lowest body condition score was uh, at the winter time at 2.5 more or less. And the highest at spring for one animal went to 4.25. Uh, but yeah, in the winter we need to fed them. So they were eating hay ad libitum um, and they were eating uh, three, times, three times a week um, around 500 grams of concentrate feed each. Um, and, and hay ad libitum, and this went on for at least three months, of course, it dependent, and we needed to go there. Uh, in summer, we needed to go there at least sometimes more, three times a week because of water, because it was really hot, and you know we need to ensure that they had access to water. So yeah, this can work. And these were two mares and one stallion. Um, they, they, they didn't... Um, get pregnant at the first year. They are pregnant now, actually, <laughs> uh, the two mares. And these animals, they stayed there for two years uh, in that area. So it, it is possible. Of course, we need to, to ensure uh, that these animals have, we need to feed them when they don't have uh, feed or when they don't leave the area, OK? Um, but it's, it was a very interesting. So some final considerations. So we know that. Uh, equ equids are able to include up to 30% of woody species in their diet. These animals have actually an important part in maintaining biodiversity in several agrosystems. Their be feeding behavior and preferences allow an important role in the maintenance of biodiversity and simultaneously produce environmental and socioeconomic benefits to rural populations. So these advantages can, should be further explored. And it seems as an alternative use for these animals. An alternative and not only an alternative, I would say a complementary, complementary use because we can be producing meat. And I know this is what is happening in, for example, a lot of meat production systems, mountain production systems, and still provide these services. We can produce you know, leisure horses and still provide these services. So these are clearly ecosystem and so social services. Uh, they can also constitute a biological tool for controlling shrub encroachment. And the study that I was just talking to you about, this was with the objective of preventing forest fires. So this was 
uh, you know, forest fire people <laughs> looking at horses to do that. Uh, we were just aiding, you know, in, in the horse park. Um, and this is ecosystem services. Does this have a price? Okay, how do we put a price on this? Shouldn't we be actually paying for these services, you know, for, for, for this, whoops, okay, my time is, is up. Oh, no, okay, okay, now I can't close it. Ah, my God. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah, it is, we should. Good. Yeah. And I finished, see you in port, I'm going to try to cut this off, okay. Ah, just give me 30 seconds. Next, this year, Puerto. <laughs> These are the horse commission sessions. Abstract is open. Abstract submission is open. Registration is also open. Um, and we wait for you all in Porto to submit your abstract and to register. And for sure, the horse commission will have amazing sessions as always. And we will have a great technical tour that I can ensure you and see you in Porto. And I'm finishing. <laughs> Thank you, Anna Sofia. Thank you a lot for your presentation. Uh, your presentation has raised so many questions that uh, we we cannot anyway consider all of them by now. Maybe it can be the uh, at the discussion part. I just uh, uh, would spend a few minutes for uh, one single question that came from Jackie Trappist. In terms of eco grazing, which animal species do you find useful? Sheep, cattle, goat, equines, but also geese, for example. And what is the place for uh, of equines in this classification? You touched this, but maybe showing some some data, but maybe you want to make a reply to this question. Yeah, this this is a very good question, and and it's a question. I I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't choose a species. <laughs> it really depends on the area that you have. Uh, the, the, what you want to clean, the objective that you have. Uh, and uh, I would go for a mixed grazing in most situations and to add and mix the species according to your objectives. And that will depend on the area, if it's a mountain area, if it's a rangeland, if it's you know, a down area and the species that you have. So to combine the species behavior with the, the, the vegetation available and the objective that you have. And geese are actually great, actually great. Good to point out the geese. I was focusing on, on, on mammals, but geese, geese, yeah, they have an, a huge impact if you put them in, in high numbers, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, we, I apologize with all the people that participate with questions. So some other people, uh, some debate, there's a great debate about on uh, the topic that's uh, uh, this topic, uh, but so uh, we uh, need to move on. And before to start with the next presentation, I will uh, take 10 minutes break. As, uh, so, hello. Hello, thank you everybody for, thank you all participants for being still present in this uh, uh, webinar from the Post Commission on the AFP. We have one last uh, presentation for the general discussion. Uh, is uh, uh, given by Rhys Evans, that is uh, the president of the host commission. Let me introduce him uh, with a brief. Uh, uh, he is an uh, associate professor at the University College of Green uh, Development uh, in uh, Bry, Norway, and the president of the host commission, he has already said. Uh, he's a, a human geographer. And he has been a pioneer in the field of human horse relations since starting the Equine Research Network in 2009. His work covers a wide range of topics uh, within the field uh, from transcendence uh, to what is working horse in the 21st century. His most re recent focus being upon the changes the sector has undergone. Uh, we entered the 21st uh, century economy with uh, its emphasis on the service sector and the experience economy. In particular, his research focuses uh, upon the growing role the clients uh, are playing in uh, a Europe dominated by urbanism, stress and detachment uh, from our historic rural roots, and how, as a production system, the acquiring world can bring positive solutions and opportunities uh, to the challenges. Okay, I hope uh, that's uh, have, uh, 
make a good introduction of yourself. Maybe you can say something more. And, uh, anyway, increase the, uh, the participant group is yours. You can start your Thank talk. You. There we go. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. And you can hear me OK. OK. Good. Go ahead. OK, we will. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It's so great to see so many people here. Um, and of course, this, uh, this presentation is part of this theme of old friends in new times. You know, those of us who work in human horse relations have seen so many changes, especially recently. And so this is, in a sense, what I'm hoping to get a bit of a grasp for on here. My presentation is actually called Rural Horses in an Urbanized World, Providing Essential Services to a Modern European uh, Population. So to start out with the requisite, you know, horses have been part of our lives, which have been predominantly rural for thousands of years, but they've also been a key part of urban civilization. You know, horses were a, a key contributor to the development of, for example, the Industrial Revolution and the urban transformations which uh, accompanied it, sorry, accomplished it. Well, that too, I suppose. Because horses were the multipliers which enabled urban economies, urban housing patterns. I mean, distance for work, for example. You think about the growth of the omnibus towed by horses in the cities prior to that. That, you know, you did, people lived right next to their factories. And with before you had streetcar suburbs, you had horse-drawn omnibus suburbs. And even, you know, the cartage of urban food supplies, all of which created the possibility of larger and larger cities in Europe. Now, historically, the number of horses in Europe reached its maximum at, at the height of the steam train era. So we're still talking in the early 20th century here. Horses were needed to get goods from factory to train and from train to customer. And to, to, to take, by the way, some of, the, some of these are quotes and I haven't put the references in because I only have 20 minutes and I could probably spend 10 minutes just telling you the names of all the references. But we can certainly, if anybody's interested, we can supply them. The steam engine, because of its unprecedented ca capacity to transport people and goods, triggered an almost insatiable need for horses, in particular for the heavier types. Because trains and ships moved between fixed terminal locations, horses were required for anything or anyone to reach its final destination. So we would tend to think that, you know, the steam trains started to eliminate horses. In fact, they created a hyper demand for them. And so it's estimated that the peak of the horse population in Europe was found between 1910 and 1920. And just like the terrible impacts left by the First World War on human communities, so, of course, were the impacts on the equine population. We hope we've all seen, you know, these heartrending stories of horses bred, sent to war and dying. Um, although there is some very interesting stories from Finland about war horses coming back to their farms, which is actually very interesting. Unfortunately, though, for horses, it marked the beginning of a permanent decline. It's, esti it's estimated that the horse population declined in the range of 90% between 1921 and 1920. 61, there's some argument about that last figure. But I mean, if you were to graph this, it would just be a precipitous decline. Why? Well, again and again, when we look at accounts of the decline of a breed or yeah, yeah, a horses in a particular place, we see them replaced generally with the internal combustion engine. Um, and one example only will be more than enough to demonstrate the case, and that's the Faroese pony. Now, the Faroese pony comes from the same basic genetic stock as the Icelandic horse. 
Um, and indeed, they, they like the Icelanders, the Faroese boast that for over 800 years, the genetic bloodlines have not been diluted of the Faroese pony. And these were used to work on farms. They were bred to be tough uh, animals that could stay outside all winter in the North Atlantic environment and to not require, you know, craft for uh, grain. Um, to be of a mild temperament. And without them, life on the Faroes Islands historically would not have been anywhere near so successful. More importantly, for our argument, prior to the first Second World War, hundreds of these ponies were exported to the UK each year to work as pit ponies in the mines. And the mechanization of the mines during the course of the war meant that this trade ended. And what we discover is by the 1970s, there were only seven Faroese ponies left. And they actually, people I know, found a man attempting to geld the last two stallions. And his response was, you don't need these anymore. You've got tractors. So why was this why was this attitude so so you know uh, common well horses are part of production systems and production systems need economic imperatives to function in other words you've got to find a way of making money out of breeding these horses now fortunately there are other economic uses to which uh, these you know horses can lend themselves and not only is that the topic of this talk, but fortunately, it's becoming the savior of many breeds that are endangered. And just as an example, there are now nearly 100 Faroese ponies. Um, their numbers have been slowly growing as a bunch of very dedicated, passionate people have really worked hard, not only to, uh, you know, to, to rebuild their numbers, but to engage in scientific breeding, to minimize inbreeding, etc. And I was very heartened to learn just this year that there is a campaign in the Faroes to, to allow Faroese ponies to be exported to Dan Denmark for new herds to be started. Um, and that really, you know, the very fact that they could say, well, we can afford to let a few mares and a few stallions go tells you of the difference between when I got involved with them in 2011, in which there were 71 and, you know, how it is now. Now that's been that, that catastrophic decline in population because there's no economic imperative to breed these horses has been repeated across breeds, across locations, all over Europe in many ways, except, well, except for, of course, the ones for whom there is an economic imperative, like sport horses and some leisure horses. So now I want to, I want to, you know, raise this question, rural or urban, you know, traditionally we think of horses as rural creatures. Indeed, traditionally we think of them as livestock. And the whole point of this presentation is to get you to maybe rethink some of those stereotypes and cliches. You know, we associate horses with agriculture, but as Anna Sophia said, since even since the formation of the EU, that's not really been the case. They're not considered agricultural animals in most of most European countries. And yet where we do count horses, and it is of as Anna Sophia said, of great frustration that we don't know how many horses there are, we still only count them on farms. And if you think about it, okay, I did, an ag I did a horse census in a municipality here in Norway some years ago. And by far, there were more horse herds, if you will, small horse businesses, in which there was between three and five horses but there were a few breeding farms with large numbers. So you have a few farms with lots of horses on them and a lot of farms with a few horses on them. But we only count the ones on the farms. 
The trouble is, of course, that horses don't perform traditional work on farms. And so therefore, they're a cost, not a benefit. Here in Norway, what you find, if you, if you, for, for example, is, you know, the sport of trav, of trotting, which is, you know, the dominant, really the dominant, um, you know, competitive sport still across most of Scandinavia. It, the numbers are declining, and the participants are, their age is getting older and older and older. And what I find here in that same in that same uh, horse census, uh, which was designed, by the way, to support creating a 10 year agricultural policy concerning horses in a municipality uh, near where my institution is. Um, it was older retired farmers whose sons or daughters had taken over the farm who were keeping and raising the trotting horses, the trot pest. So in some ways, they are an indulgence. They're a symbol of an authentic past, yes, but there's no formal economic imperative to keep or breed them, apart from passion on the parts of a few individuals. And yet, many horses persist on farms. An important question then is, what kind of farms are they found on? And generally, we find them on small farms, ones that are unsuitable to large-scale industrial agriculture, in fact. And these small farms are extremely important for the green assets they deliver to society, if only because small farms make up in the range of 80% of all the farms across Europe. You know, we deal with this 80-20 rule where 20% of the farms produce 80% of the national agricultural economy. And 80% of the farms deliver only 20% of the national agricultural economy. But they're important for what they actually do deliver, which isn't huge, massive amounts of food, but these green assets. So we do see, of course, especially within equine sport, these clusters of activity, which include some large scale production of horses but the majority of horse farms are small scale. And of course, they're seldom raised for food anymore, even though our colleagues, of course, have done this research on horse meat and horse milk. We all know how controversial that is. Um, these horses are raised to be ridden. Well, hopefully to be ridden. And yet, this is an animal production system. It's just one very different from the past and different from the massive scale of most other animal production systems. And of course, you know, we have breeders, we see, you know, all of the components of a production system, but most of it does not go towards producing food. And strangely, despite this massive dis decline in numbers. Since the 1980s, the number of riders and horses have been on an upward trend in Europe. Although there's been variations, like for example, during the 2008 recession, generally numbers across Northern Europe anyway, have grown in the range of seven to 8% a year. Um, more riders, more horses. So there's something going on there. There is some value to society in this new equine production system. <clears throat> now, I don't want to repeat, uh, you know, what, what Anna Sophia was giving you. And in fact, her numbers are newer than mine. Mine were 2009. I think she had a 2018 numbers. We all know that they're somewhat elastic. But for me, what's really interesting in this these figures is that 70 to 80 percent of horses are used in leisure and recreation. What other industry do we ignore 70 to 80 percent of the production and focus on, say, sport as we do, or niche things like, you know, heavy horse? Um, and of course, you know, I've been saying this, those of you who know me <laughs> will know that I've been saying this for some time. You know, we need to understand that most of the horses in Europe are being used for something that we think of almost 
as secondary. And yet the numbers are not secondary. And this is the part of the industry that's growing. And it can be seen in tourism. It can certainly be seen in therapy, therapeutic uses, in education. And it can be seen in, in, in activities that we don't even hardly recognize within the equine sector, like health and well-being or fitness and outdoor recreation. I mean, surely if, you know, having a chain of gymnasiums, training centers, is a significant economic activity, well, then what we do with horses could be considered that way too. And not only that, within this, we see this constant innovation in new activities, new uses, and, and this is what I think is important, new economic imperatives for breeding horses. <coughs> Why? Why is this working this way? Well, it's my, my thesis, that society is changing and the way we work with horses changes with it. So in 2013, for the first time, and this, this actually agrees with that graph that Anna Sophia put up about Mediterranean populations living in rural and urban locations. For in 2013, for the first time, over half of the European population lived in cities. For the first time in human history, over half of us live in cities. It's even higher now. And of course, why? Well, you know, jobs, better disposable income, all sorts of other things that go with that. And yet, city life is missing some important things. I often, when I teach this, I often um, uh, say this to, to my students. What's urban life like? Well, we live in a little box with our family and then we get up in the morning and we get into an even smaller metal box and we drive on these roads with all these other little metal boxes until we get to a big box and we park and we get out. We walk into a big box and walk into a littler box and then we sit in front of an even smaller box all day doing things and then at the end of the day we reverse that order until we're back in our own little suburban box. What's missing in that life? And of course, it's obvious, isn't it, you know? Um, we're missing being outdoors every day. We're missing daily activity and exercise. We're missing the social interaction that happens when we encounter not only other writers, but these other, these, you know, this ineffable relationship we have with this, these other beings. You know, we're wanting you know, we're wanting stimulation and, you know, learning about horses is a kind of knowledge that you can never learn everything, you know. Um, that drives a lot of urban economic behavior. You know, our modern daily life isolates us from nature and from other social influences. I mean, you walk down the city street and everybody's got their mobile phone out, you know, as they're going down the street. Nobody's meeting each other's eyes. We have increased income, but we have increased stress. And we've seen the rise of outdoor recreation and all sorts of other fields, the growing importance of active fitness. The growth of mobility, tourism and travel, both locally as well as abroad and of course social media access to information that previously was much more difficult to access so it's my assertion that the change to the equine sector mirrors changes in the economic sectors more broadly at one point horses were involved in the production sector in farming and logging in the secondary sector, in industry, and in the tertiary sector, in transportation services. Now, they're involved in the quaternary sector, which is services such as tourism, recreation, health, and well-being. And that is now the dominant producer of wealth and economic growth in modern societies, that consumption sector, that tertiary sector. So there is a parallel, of course there is, you know, between the rest of human socio-economy and what is going on with horses. 
And specifically, we see the growth at these subsectors in the in the horse sector. Health and well-being, leisure and recreation, adventure sports, cultural heritage, tourism, stress reduction activities, the experience economy. And that same change can be found in the horse world, not just in activities, but in the knowledge that underpins them. And as new knowledges and practices transfer more widely from society to the horse world, this affects owners' expectations, behaviors, and desires. And we see this. We see this in people wanting to know more about the, you know, the new ethology, people, you know, the various styles of horse keeping, horse personship, <laughs> right? Um, we see all of these new innovative, creative ways of relating with horses, and they do parallel similar changes in society. So urban needs, rural friends, yeah. Most, more of us live fast-paced urban lives. We, we want and need ways of coping with this. These lives also allow us to afford to engage in what I'm going to call therapeutic activities, not just for illness, but for well-being. And it's remarkable. I have been known to arrange for presentations about uh, socio-pedagogic use of horses with uh, poorly socialized teenage boys, hippotherapy, you know, recovery from uh, um, surgery, you know, horses and mental health. And then I get up at the end and I say, it's been a long time since I was a juvenile delinquent and I haven't broken anything in a while. And a lot of people think I'm crazy, but nobody's written it down on a piece of paper. But every time I interact with horses, I get the same benefits as those teenagers, as those hospital patients, as those people taking therapy. It's good for us all. And I think that's partly why more and more people are turning to horses to find that vital counter to stressed out urban lives. So there may be a new economic imperative for the breeding of horses. Will it drive the same breeding and support the same activities? Probably not. At least that's what my experience has suggested so far. But horses and riding are growing, growing faster than the growth of the population in Europe. And this is because they provide something that the urban population wants and needs. <clears throat> well and good, Reese. Yes, 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 yes. He goes on about this all the time. Yeah, yeah. But there's some challenges for us here because it's, it's going to bring changes. And some of those changes, just here's a short list, you know. Breeding and activities will likely move geographically to more peri-urban locations so that those urban people can access them. For example, some research I've done suggests there's no point sending out a, what the English would call livery yards, we in Norway call a stall, more than a 45 minute drive from a major population uh, source. People won't drive further than that to go and visit their horses every day. The type of activities engaged with will change. The skills needed to participate in the equine sector will change, and we see this in you know some of the uh, education offerings now you know starting to be offered. The types of breeds, the qualities, and other factors in breeding will change. An important thing we need to keep in mind is the emphasis on services mean that horses now work in the service sector. And just as an aside, my, my regular challenge for veterinary science is human occupational medicine had to come up with a whole new set of diseases and ways of approaching illness when the service sector took over. You know, my dad, when he worked in the factory, he could break his back. When I work in the stressed out bank, I get sick later. You know, I get ulcers. And, you know, the occupational medicine had to change to acknowledge that. And I think we still have some way to go in terms of veterinary science to really get a handle on that. 
how we see our relationships with horses will change. And importantly, and this is something the EAP can contribute to, how we make policy for horses will have to change. Because we have to face challenges. We'll need to create new land planning rules to accommodate all of this. We'll need to bring new ways to bring new activities into the mainstream of the equine world. And of course, we all know, because we're part of it, bringing change into the culture of equestrian enterprise can be challenging. We're going to need new types of education and skills development. Breeders will need to reevaluate their decisions and strategies. You know, uh, an equine tourism project I had, one of the most interesting plaints I heard from horse tourism providers was the breeders don't breed good tourism horses. They breed, you know, fancy cup winners. And boy, when you get a good horse, you hold on to it because they're not that common. We need to see workhorses in a whole new life. What is horse work? I mean, after all, if the girl in the gym who's instructing your class is working, are those horses not working too? And we we, we will re need to rethink how we see horse think how we see horses as companion animals because obviously you know, passe Donna Haraway companion they share our bread yeah but they don't sleep in our beds, you know we, we're going to have to rethink what it means. Yes, we care about them. And yes, you know, we don't see them as food. We see them as to be fed. But we need to really th rethink, what do we mean? What, is, what, is, what, is, what do horses you know, mean as companion animals? And of course, policy itself will have to be revisited on both a local and a European level. So, in conclusion, animal production has always served society. But modern societies are changing faster than ever before. I mean, this is documentable, right? The nature of these changes, in particular, the organization of economic activity and the changing role of animal identities and the perception of animal sentience, bring new challenges both for social science and biological science as it deals with horses. Yet, that basic human-horse relation which lies at the core of so much of what we do with horses will remain that special bond you know between the individuals of two species it will remain at the heart of the delivery of new benefits new activities new economic imperatives to keep breeding horses and horses will help us make our hectic stressful urban lives better while we learn more and more how to make their lives better too So thank you very much. Many thanks, Rhys, uh, for your nice presentation. Um, I've seen that during uh, your presentation, there has been debate uh, on the chat, uh, particularly both Pasquale and Ana Sofia answered uh, to some of the old questions that were still open, uh, posed by some participants uh, that we uh, didn't uh, Present. So uh, I don't think now it's time to uh, go back again to uh, some answers that the speakers gave uh, in the chat. But uh, there's uh, only one question that still remain that have not been answered by anyone. That is from Agatha Zekic from France, I think. And she, she wrote on the chat, can we imagine a future genetic selections uh, on this specific trait? She mentioned, for example, capacity to clear in a zone, but maybe we can extend the, the, the questions to uh, Reese and Pasquale too, uh, because we can even imagine a future genetic selection for milk and horse. Can we imagine any future genetic selection even for the new traits? Uh, that's, uh, in some case, uh, uh Reese mentioned in his presentation so uh any one of you would uh, would make an answer to these final questions <laughs> uh maybe who wants to start well I, I i can i can start uh 
concerning the the yeah the ability to 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 eat <laughs> i think most of them have that ability very well developed in general however in in these hard harsh areas yeah i would go for for you know local breeds and and more rustic and robust uh, breeds uh, and eventually yeah I would, I would, I would uh, then ask at the end for Roberto because you're the genetic guy <laughs> to to address this. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think robustness uh, would be an at least for mountain and bush areas would be a needed, a needed, a needed characteristic for for this. Um, yeah. I agree with you since uh, it's not probably a question of selecting uh, some specific breed but it's just to use the better breed in the environment that uh, you have in specific uh, situation so that's probably the most uh, intelligent things to do not selecting a, a already existing breed but using the most uh, rustic one if, okay. if i can jump in I'm actually in the middle of writing a book called Nurturing Nature, which is about native breeds. And I'm, I'm actually focusing on native breeds as what the social theory people call socio-natural constructs. And I mean, every breeding involves three things. It involves the vast genetic potential in every individual, of which only a small amount is expressed. The intention of the breeder, the human breeder, and it's, see, this is why I'm focusing on native breeds, because we think that native breeds spring from the mountains. No, these are farmers and people who've actually made breeding choices as sophisticated as anybody else's, but we don't know their names. And the environment in which they're all located. And so, you know, yeah, I agree. You know, I agree with Roberto. I think there's a potential within many breeds that hasn't been expressed that potentially could be, yeah? So, but of course, again, that, you know, there's the environment, which is the gorse that is to be eaten. There is the genetic potential, which is in the horse. And then there's the human choice making. You know, who am I going to breed? And who am I going to bring together? And what traits do I want to come from that breeding? Thank you. Any comments from Pasquale? Yes, just a joke uh, regarding the genetic and genomic selection. Uh, the genetician's colleagues are able to select uh, whatever we want. The problem is, are the phenotypes. <laughs> but uh, the, actually, the problem is that uh, several breeds and population have a uh, a so uh, poor no number of ads that the uh, criticity, the first step, is uh, ensuring uh, uh, a sufficient number of ads for avoiding inbreeding uh, uh, erosion and damage. Then uh, we uh, will be able to also to select, although autochthonous breeds are self-selected, for living and optimizing feed in uh, in the country in the areas where uh, they uh, usually stay. they live. I totally agree with you. It uh, uh, probably is not a question of selecting animals, but is using the specific breed uh, adapted more well adapted to the that specific environment and preserve the breed from inbreeding, that is the main problem, rather than uh, select them. So um, I don't see any more questions uh, on the chat, to the people that uh, are in some way uh, thinking, uh, thanking uh, all the presentation and the answer even. So uh, considering that is five minutes past four and we were supposed to finish by, um, 4 p.m. I would like to thank everybody. Maybe, Reese, uh, would you like to, as uh, president of the EAP, would you like to, or the host commission at the EAP, would like to say some uh, 
close your comments, sir? Or... <laughs> right, of course. Just a minute. I have something prepared in my... <laughs> no, I don't. Roberto. Um, but yes, absolutely. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming and participating and indeed sharing their opinions, you know. Um, it's what keeps us as a research community stimulated, yeah? And it's very important. And I want to also challenge everybody to look at those things that we take for granted around horses and question them. Because, you know, that is the ultimate point of science, is to get us to question those taken for granted, you know, to think critically. Not criticize, but to think critically. And I still find in a lot of the equine community, there's a bit too much criticism and not enough critical thinking. You know, um, and it just remains to me to invite you all to join us in Porto next summer. We have the best uh, possible organizer we could uh, we could uh, hope for. Um, yes, and we've got a great tour. And um, by the way, one of the sessions that we've had an immense response from all of the other commissions for is. We've got a challenge session on social license to operate, which we thought about after our challenge session in Davos last year <coughs> about equine end of life. And so I proposed it to all the presidents of the other commissions. What is your, how does your social license to operate work? And what are you doing about it? Because clearly, you know, these, you know, there's a whole lot of social forces that are acting uh in opposition to animal production systems and i have to say that we've that seven of the commissions have responded and will participate and i think we're going to see a really interesting and lively session so that's just one come and join us um and i mean what better place to do it than Porto? yes thank you all very much thank you Riz. Uh, we have just a few uh seconds uh, i want to thank again the aap for the perfect organization they gave to this seminar and uh, the three speakers uh, race uh, anna sofia and particularly for uh, remember the, the our important meeting in porto next uh, in the next uh, early september i think I remember well and uh, so and thank you uh, particularly to all the participants that uh, uh, stayed out this time uh, following the webinar. So thank you again to everybody and see you next next time. I'll see you in Portugal.